are you looking for, sir? Who? Mrs. Clitheroe. No. Oh, I She's out, I think. I've seen her going. Would you? She had to be. It's all the place with her. No. Carlos, I see. You have a parcel for her. Right, so. I'll take it. Excuse me. Where? Here? No, there. Right, so. Am I to put Maggie or Mrs. washes it? You don't know. Oh, excuse me. I wonder what's that now. Oh, a hat! God, she's going to the devil lately for style. That hat now costs more than a penny. Such notions of operosity she's getting. Oh, swank. What? <laughs> she's a pretty little Judy all the same. Ah. She is and she isn't. There's prettiness and prettiness in it. I'm always saying that her skirts are a little too short for a married woman. And to see her sometimes of an evening in her glad neck gown would make a body's blood run cold. I do be ashamed of me life before her husband. And the way she tries to be polite with her good morning, Mrs. Gogan, when she's going down, and her good evening, Mrs. Gogan, when she's coming up. But there's politeness and politeness in it. Well, they seem to get on well together all the same. They do and they don't. The pair of them used to be like two turtle doves, always billing and cooing. You couldn't come into the room, but you'd feel instinctive like that they'd just been after kissing and cuddling each other. It often made me shiver. For after all, there's kissing and cuddling in it. But I'm thinking he's beginning to take things more quietly. The mystery of having a woman's a mystery no longer. She dresses herself to keep him with her, but it's no use. After a month or two, the wonder of a woman wears off. I don't know, I don't know. Not wishing to say anything derogatory, but I think it's all a question of location. When a man finds the wonder of one woman beginning to die, it's usually beginning to live in another. She's always grumbling about having to live in a tenement house. I wouldn't like to spend me last hour in one, let alone live me life in a tenement, says she. But, says she, that are hiding the dead instead of homes that are sheltering the living. Many a good one, says I, was reared in a tenement house. Oh, you know, she's a well-up little lassie too. Able to make a shilling go where another would have to spend a pound. She's wiping the eyes of the covey and poor old Peter. Everybody knows that. Screwing every penny she can out of them in order to turn the place into a babby house. And she has the life frightened out of them. Washing their face, combing their hair, wiping their feet, brushing their clothes, trimming their nails, cleaning their teeth. God almighty, you'd think the poor men were undergoing penal servitude. Ah, that's going beyond the beyonds in a <sighs> tenement house. That's a little bit too derogatory. <laughs> God almighty, give me patience. I wonder what he's filstering for now. He's adorning himself at a meeting tonight. Mm. Uh, great demonstration and torchlight procession around places in the city sacred to the memory of Irish patriots to be concluded by a meeting at which will be taken an oath of fealty to the Irish Republic. Formation in Parnell Square at 8 o'clock. Well, they can hold it for Fluta. I'm up the pole. No more drink for Fluta. It's three days now since I touched a drop, and I feel a new man already. Isn't old Peter a funny-looking little man? Like something you'd pick off a Christmas tree. When he's dressed up in his canonicals, you'd wonder where he'd been got. <gasps> God, forgive me. When I see him in them, I always think he must have had a Mormon for a father. Mm. He and the Covey can't abide each other. The pair of them is always at it, trying to best each other. There'll be blood drawn one of these days. How is it that Clitheroe himself now doesn't have anything to do with the citizen army? A couple of months ago and you'd hardly ever see him without his gun and the red hand of liberty all in his hat. Just because he wasn't made a captain of. 
He wasn't going to be in anything where he couldn't be conspicuous. He was so cocksure of being made one that he bought a Sam Brown belt and was always putting it on and standing at the door showing it off till the man came and put out the street lamps on him. God, I think he used to bring it to bed with him. But I'm telling you, herself was delighted that that cock didn't crow. For she's like a clock in hen if he leaves her sight for a minute. Mm. By the look of it, this must have been a general's sword. All the gold lace and the fine figaries on it. Sure, it's twice too big for him. <laughs> it's a baby's rattle you ought to have. And he as he is with Todd's tossing in his head of what may happen to him on the day of judgment. <laughs> oh, excuse me, isn't he the sorely old rascal? Take no notice of him. You'd think he was dumb, but when you get his goat, or he has a few jars up, he's voice of air, sir. <laughs> mm. Oh, you got a cold on your flute. Ah, it's only a little one. You'd to be careful all the same. I knew a woman. A big lump of a woman, red-faced and round-bodied, a little awkward on her feet. You'd think, to look at her, she could put out her two arms and lift a two-storied house on the top of her head. Got a tickling in her throat and a little cough. And the next morning she had a little catching in her chest. And they had just time to wet her lips with a little rum. And off she went. It's only a little cold I have. There's nothing derogatory wrong with me. I don't know. There's many a man this minute lowering a pint, thinking of a woman, or picking out a winner, or doing work as you're doing, while the hair's thrown by the horses with the black plumes is driving up to his own hall door, and a voice that he doesn't hear is muttering in his ear, earth to earth, ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. A man in the pink of health should have a holy horror of allowing thoughts of death to be festered in his mind. But, <laughs> be God, I think I'm after getting a little catch in me chest that time. It's a creepy thing to be thinking about. Uh, it is and it isn't. It's both bad and good. It always gives myself a kind of trespassing joy to feel myself moving along in a morning coach and me thinking that maybe... The next funeral will be me own. And glad, in a quiet way, that this is somebody else's. And a curious kind of gasp and for breath. I hope there's nothing derogatory wrong with me. Frills on it. Like a woman's petticoat. Suddenly getting hot and then just as suddenly getting cold. Who would you like to be wearing this Lord Mayor's nightdress, Fluther? Blast you in your night shirt. It's a man fermenting with fear to stick the showing off to him of a thing that looks like a shining shroud. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> The God Almighty give me patience. Excuse me. What's the man repairing the streets cheering for? You can't sneeze, but that old one wants to know the why and the wherefore. I feel as dizzy as be damned. I hope I didn't give up the beer too suddenly. happening, Covey? Ah, the job's stopped. They've immobilised the march and the demonstration tonight under the plough and the stairs. <laughs> Didn't you hear them cheering the mugs? They have to renew their political baptismal vows to be faithful in seculo secularum. There's no reason to bring religion into it. I think we ought to have as great a regard for religion as we can, so as to keep it out of as many things as possible. <laughs> oh! You're one of the boys that climb into religion as high as a short mass on Sunday mornings. Suppose you'll be singing songs of Sion and songs of Third at the meeting too. We're all Irishmen anyhow, aren't we? <coughs> uh, look, here, comrade. There's no such thing as an Irishman or an Englishman or a German or a Turk. We're all only human beings. Scientifically speaking, it's all a question of the accidental gathering together of molecules and atoms. <laughs> molecules and atoms. Do you think I'm going to listen to you trying to juggle Fluter's mind with complicated conundrums of molecules and atoms? There's nothing complicated in it. There's no fear of the church telling you that molecules is a sticking together of millions of atoms of sodium, carbon, potassium, or iodide, etc. That according to the way they're mixed to make a flower, a fish, a star that you see shining in the sky... Or a man with a big brain, like me. Or a man with a little brain, like you. There's no necessity to be raising your voice. Shouting's no manifesting forth of a growing mind. Girl, give me patience with this thing. 
She makes these collars as stiff with starch as a shining band of solid steel. She does it purposely to try and thwart me. If I can't get it on the singlet, how in the name of God am I going to get it on the short? There's no use arguing with you. It's education you want, comrade. The Covey and God made the world, I suppose. Well, when I hear some men talking, I'm inclined to disbelieve that the world's 800 million years old. But it's not long since the fathers of some of them crawled out of the shelter and slime at the sea. Going to march away. Molecules. What about Adam and Eve? Yeah, well, what about What them? about them, you? Adam and Eve, is that as far as you've got? You still think there was nobody in the world before Adam and Eve? Did you ever hear, man, of the skeleton of the man of Java? Oh, blast it, blast it, blast it. Ah, you're not going to be let tap your rubbish your thoughts into the mind of Fluto. No, you're afraid to listen to the truth. Who's afraid? You were. Go away, you would him. Who's a word You were. You wouldn't talk the way you're talking. Ah, the old ignorant savage lepping up in you. Then science shows you that the head of your god is an empty one. Well, I hope you're enjoying the blessing of having to live be the sweat of your brow. You'll be kicking and yelling for the priest yet, me bio. I'm not gonna stand silent and simple listening to a tick like you making a maddening mockery of God Almighty. It'd be a nice derogatory thing on me conscience and me dying to look back and remember and shame of talking to a ward-weaving little ignorant yahoo of a red flag socialist. Oh, for God's sake, Fluther, drop it. There's always the makings of a row in the mention of religion. Oh, bless us. It's a naked woman. Yeah. What's under her? Georgina, the sleep in Venice. Oh, that's a terrible picture. Oh, that's a shocking picture. Oh, the one that got that taken, she must have been a prime lassie. <laughs> what are you he, he and every FR? That's a nice thing to be he, he and about. Where's your morality, man? God forgive us, it's not right to be looking at it. It's nearly a derogatory thing to be in the room where it is. <laughs> I couldn't stop any longer in the same room with three men after looking at it. <laughs> Where are you throwing them? Are you trying to thwart and torment me again? Who's trying to thwart you? Yeah, you're not going to make me lose my temper, me young Kobe. Uh, if you're not as pet itself, you're not going to get your way in everything. Oh, I'll just say nothing. I leave you to the day when the all pitiful, all merciful, all loving God be handing you to the angels to be reaving and roasting you, tearing and tormenting you, and blasting you. That's what you, the little malignant owl bastard. You lemon whiskered owl swine! God! Fluter! Fury! Fluter! Hold him! Fury! It's a nice thing to have a lunatic like this lashing around with a leaf of weapon! Let me out! Let me out! Isn't it a hard thing for the man who wouldn't say a word against his greatest enemy to have to listen to that Kobe's thwarting animosities shoving poor patient people into a lashing out of courses that darken his soul with the shadow of the wrath of the last day? Why'd you take notice of him? If he's saying you didn't, he'd say nothing derogatory. I'll make him stop his laughing and leering, chipping and jeering and scared of fine people with his corner by insinuations. He's always trying to rouse me. If it's not a song, it's a whistle. If it isn't a whistle, it's a cough. But you can taunt and taunt. I'm laughing at you! Huh? Jeez. Do you hear that? Do you hear him sounding forth his devil soul song of provocation? What are you going to do? I'll do for you! I'll do for you! I'll do for you! Oh, can I not turn me back with the two of you around it like a pair of fighting cocks? Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! Mm. Uncle Peter! Oh, oh, Uncle Peter, Uncle Peter, be damned. Do you think I'm going to get a free pass to the young Kobe to turn me whole life into a holy manual of penances and martyrdoms? If you want to exercise some sort of control over that Uncle Peter of yours, there'll be a funeral, and it won't be me that'll be in the hearse. Are you always going to be tearing down the little bit of respectability that a body's trying to build up? Huh? Am I always going to be having to nurse you into the hardy habit of trying to keep up a little bit of appearance? Why well, weren't you here to see the way he ruined me with the sword? Oh, what did you call me a lemon whisker I'll swine for? The two of you don't try to make a generous alteration in your goings on and keep on trying to inarguate the customs of the rest of the house into this place. You can flit into other lodgings where your bowsy battling on me may be 
with the long core. Would you like to be called a lemon whisker doll swine? Hey, <laughs> if you attempt to wag that sword of yours at anybody again, it'll have to be taken off you and put in a safe place away from babies that don't know the dangers in here. Well, I'm not gonna let anybody call me a lemon whiskered old swine. Opening and shutting now with a well-mannered motion, like a door of a select bar in a high-class pub. And once for all, Willie, you'll have to try to deliver yourself from the desire of provoking El Pater into a wild forgetfulness of what's proper and allowable in a respectable home. Yeah, well, let him mind his own business then. Yesterday, I caught him he he and out of him, and he reading bits of Janerski's thesis on the origin, development and consolidation of the evolutionary idea of the proletariat. No. Let it end at that, for God's sake. The jack will be in any minute, and I'm not going to have the quiet of this evening tossed about in an everlasting uproar between you and Uncle Peter. <sighs> well, did you manage to settle the lock yet, Mr. Gordon? It's better than a new one now, Mrs. Clitheroe. It's almost ready to open and shut of its own accord. You're a whole man. How many points will that get you? Near a one at all, Mrs. Critterow, for fluters on the water wagon now. You could stand where you're standing chanting, have a glass of malt, fluter, fluter, have a glass of malt, till the bells would be ringing the old year out and the new year in, and you'd have as much chance of moving, fluter, as a tune on a tin whistle would move a deaf man, and he dead. Putting a new lock on her door. Afraid her poor neighbours would break through and steal. Maybe, now. They're a damn size more honest than your ladyship. Checking the children playing on the stairs. Getting on the nerves of your ladyship. Complaining about Bessie Borges singing her hymns at night when she has a few up. Bessie Borges will sing whenever she damn well likes. <laughs> you little overdressed frolip, yeah. For one pin, I paste on my face. I no, no, Bessie, Bessie. Look, Bessie. Leave poor Mrs. Clitheroe alone, but she do no harm to anyone, and mine's no one's business but her own. Why is she always trying to speak proud things, and looking like a mighty one in the congregation of the people? What's up? What's after happening? Ah, nothing, Jack, nothing. It's all over now. Come on, Bessie, come on. What's wrong, Nora? Did she say anything to you? She was better than of her, and I only told her to go up out of that to her own place. Before I knew where I was, she flew at me like a tiger and tried to guzzle me. Get up to your own place, Mrs. Borges, and don't you be interfering with my wife, or it'll be the worse for you. Go on, go on! Mind who you're pushing now. I attend me place of worship anyhow. Not like some of them that go to neither church, chapel, or meeting house. If me son was home from the trenches, he'd see me right in. <laughs> there. Don't mind that old bitch, Nora, darling. I'll soon put a stop to her interfering. Oh, Some day or another, when I'm here by myself, she'll come in and do something desperate. Oh, sorry, fear of her doing anything desperate. I'll talk to her tomorrow when she's sober. A taste of me mind that'll shock her into the sensibility of behaving herself. <sighs> Willie, is that the place for your dungarees? Ah, uh, they won't do the floor any harm, will they? <clears throat> Uncle Peter! Now! Uncle Peter! Huh? Tea's ready! Another cut of bread, Uncle Peter. It's sure to be a great meeting tonight. We ought to go, now. I won't go, Jack. You can go if you wish. Mm. Do you want the sugar, Uncle Peter? No. 
Are you going to start? You're trying and you're thwarting again. Now, Uncle Peter, you mustn't be so touchy. Willie has only asked you if you wanted the sugar. He doesn't care a damn whether I want the sugar or no. He's only trying to thwart me. Now, you let him alone, Willie. If he wants the sugar, let him stretch his hand out and get it yeah. himself. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want the sugar, stretch out your hand and get it yourself. Tonight is the first chance that Brennan has got to show himself off since they made a captain of him. Why? God only knows. It'll be a treat to see him swanking it at the head of the citizen army, carrying the flag of the plough and the stars. He was sweet in you once, Nora. He may have been. I never liked him. Always thought he was a bit yeah. of a tick. They're bringing nice disgrace on that banner now. How are they bringing disgrace on it? Because it's a labor flag. It was never meant for politics. What does the design of the field plough burden on at the stairs of the heavenly plough mean if it's not communism? It's a flag that should only be used when we're building the barricades to fight for a workers' republic. <laughs> now, what are you puffing about, you for? Your mind is the mind of a mummy. <sighs> I better go out and get a good place to have a look at Ireland's warriors passing by. Oh, Willie! Brush your clothes before you go. Ah, they do well enough. Go and brush them. The brush is in the drawer there. Pine beneath them slowly, we tread the land that bore us. The green flag glitters o'er us. The friends we've tried are by our side, and the foe we hate before us. <coughs> I'm telling you, I'm young Covey, once and for all, that I'll not stick any longer these tittering. Taunts of yours, roving around to sing your slights and slanders, redden in the mind of a man to the thinking and saying the things that sicken his soul would sing. Be gone, I'm back! No, then, none of that, none of that. Uncle Peter, Uncle Peter, Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter. Little devil vermin, looking like the illegitimate son of a, an illegitimate child of a corporal in the Mexican army. He's not believing me now. It's such a state of agitation that I won't be able to do myself justice when I'm marching to the meeting. Oh, for God's sake. Here, buckle your sword on and go to your meeting so that we'll have at least one hour apiece. For well, God's sake, hurry him up out of this, Nora. Oh, it's all gone to try to start to swat me now. Shh, now your hat's on, your house is touched, off you pop. Uh. Go on! Any for them, Jack? Me? No. I was thinking of nothing. Ah, you were thinking of meeting, Jack. When we were courting and I wanted you to go, you'd say, oh, to hell with meetings. And that you felt lonely and cheering crowds when I was absent. And we weren't a month married when you began that you couldn't keep away from them. Oh, that's enough about the meeting. It looks as if you wanted me to go the way you were talking. You were always at me to give up the citizen army, and I gave it up. Surely that ought to satisfy you. Ah, you gave it up, because you got the sulks when they didn't make a captain of you. It wasn't for my sake, Jack. For your sake or no, you're benefiting by it, aren't you? I didn't forget this was your birthday, did I? <laughs> and you liked your new hat, didn't you? Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack. 
Jack, please, Jack. I thought you were tired of that sort of thing long ago. Well, you're finding out now that I haven't tired of it yet, anyhow. <laughs> Mrs. Clitheroe doesn't want to be kissed. Sure she doesn't. My little, little red lip, Nora. Oh, yes. Your little, little <sighs> red lip, Nora, is a sweet little girl when the fit seizes you. But your little, little red lip, Nora, has to clean your boots every morning all the same. Oh, well. If we're going to be snotty... It's looking like as if it was you that was going to be snotty. Bridling up with bitterness the minute a body attempts to open her mouth. Is it any wonder? Turning a tender saying into a mean and a malice in spite? It's hard for a body to be always keeping her mind bent and making thoughts that'll be no longer than the length of your own satisfaction. If we're going to dribble the time away sitting here like a pair of cranky mummies, I may as well be sewing or doing something about the place. Ah, Jack. Don't be so cross. Cross? I'm not cross. I'm not a bit cross. It was yourself started it. I didn't mean to say anything out of the way. You take a body up too quickly, Jack. You didn't offer me my evening allowance yet? How quiet the house is now. It must all be out. Suppose so. I'm longing to show you my new hat. To see what you think of it. Would, would you like to see it? I don't mind. <clears throat> well, how does Mr. Clitheroe like me new hat? <laughs> It suits you, Nora. It does right enough. Here, sit down and don't let me hear another crossword out of you for the rest of the night. <laughs> little, little red lip, Nora. Jack. Hmm? Well? You haven't sung me a song since our honeymoon. Sing me one now. Do. Mm -hmm. Please, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> what song? Since Maggie went away? Ah, no, Jack, not that. It's too sad. When you said you loved me. <clears throat> the violets were sent in the woods. Nora displaying their charm to the bee. When I first said I loved only you, Nora... And you said you loved only me. The chestnut blooms gleamed through the glade, Nora. A robin sang loud from a tree. When I first said I loved only you, <laughs> Nora. And you said you loved only me. The golden robed daffodil shone, Nora. And danced in the breeze on the lee. When I first said I loved only you, Nora, <laughs> and you said you loved only me. The trees, birds and bees sang a song, Nora, of happier transports to be. When I first said I loved only you, <laughs> Nora, and you said you loved only me. I wonder who can that be now? Take no notice of it, Jack. They'll go away in a minute. Commander de Clitheroe. Commander de Clitheroe, are you there? A message from General Jim Connolly. Damn it. It's Captain Brennan. Oh, don't mind. Don't mind him, Jack. Don't break our happiness. Pre pretend we're not in. Let us forget everything tonight but our two selves. Don't be alarmed, darling. I'll just see what he wants and send him about his business. No, no, please, Jack, don't open it. Please, for your own little Nora's sake. Oh, don't be silly, Nora. A dispatch from General Connolly. <clears throat> Come.
Commandant Clitheroe is to take command of the 8th Battalion of the OECA, which will assemble to proceed to the meeting at 9 o'clock. He is to see that all units are provided with full equipment, two days rations and 50 rounds of ammunition. At 2 o'clock a.m., the army will leave Liberty Hall for a reconnaissance attack on Dublin Castle. Commandant General Connolly. I don't understand this. Why does General Connolly call me Commandant? The staff appointed you Commandant, and the General agreed with the selection. Well, when did this happen? A fortnight ago. Well, how is it word was never sent to me? Word was sent to you. I myself brought it. Well, how did you give it to them? I think I gave it to Mrs. Clitheroe there. Nora? Do you hear that? Nora, Captain Brennan says he brought a letter to me from General Connolly and that he gave it to you. Where is it? What did you do with it? Jack, please. Jack, don't go away tonight and I'll tell you. I'll explain everything. Send him away and, and stay with your own little red lip, Nora. None of this nonsense now. I want to know what you did with the letter. Why didn't you give me the letter? What did you do with it? What did you do with the letter? I burnt it! I burnt it! That's what I did with it. Is General Connolly and the Citizen Army going to be your only care? Is your home going to be only a place to rest in? Am I going to be only something to provide merrymaking at night for you? Your vanity will be the ruin of you and me, yes. That's what's moving you. Because they've made an officer of you. You'll make a glorious cause of what you're doing while your little red-lipped Nora can go on sitting here making a companion of the loneliness of the night. You bored it, did you? <gasps> well, me good lady. <laughs> Let go, you're hurting me. You deserve to be hurt. Any letter that comes to me for the future, take care that I get it. Do you hear? Take care that I get it. You needn't wait up for me. If I'm in at all, I won't be before six in the morning. I don't care if you never come back. Come along then. Mother's gone to the meeting, and I was feeling terrible lonely, so I come down to see if you'd let me sit with you, thinking you mightn't be going yourself. I do be terrible afraid I'll die sometime when it be myself. And envy you, Mrs. Clitheroe, seeing the health you have and the lovely place you have here, and wondering if I'll ever be strong enough to be keeping a home together for a man. Oh, this must be some more of the Dublin Fusiliers flying off to the front.
There's the men marching out into the dread dimness of danger, while the lice is crawling about, feeding on the fatness of the land. But you shall not escape from the arrow that flieth be night, or the sickness that wasteth be day. And, ladyship and all, as some of them may be, they'll be scattered abroad like the dust in the darkness. Is there anybody going, Mrs. Clitheroe, with a tither of sense? Nothing much doing in your line tonight, Rosie. Oh, of course, a god in the hayperd hurley, Tom. There isn't much notice taken of a pretty petticoat of a night like this. They're all in a holy mood. The solemn-looking dials and the whole lot of them, and they march into the meeting. You'd think they were the glorious company of the saints and the noble army of martyrs tramping through the streets of paradise. They're all thinking of higher things than a girl's garters. It's a tremendous meeting. Four platforms they have. There's one of them just outside opposite the oh, window. Oh, sure. When the speaker comes to the near end here, you can see him playing and hear nearly everything he's spouting out of him. It's no joke trying to make up 55 shillings a week for your keep and laundry and taxing your quid for your own room if you bring home a friend for the night. If I could only put by a couple of quid for a swanker outfit, everything in the garden would look lovely. Wished <laughs> till we hear what he's saying. Bloodshed is a cleansing and sanctifying thing, and the nation that regards it as the final horror has lost its manhood. There are many things more horrible than bloodshed, and slavery is one of them. It's a sacred truth, mind you, what that man's after saying. But he's only a little younger. Might be plunging mad into the middle of us. <laughs> Here's the two gems running over again for the royal. <laughs> two halves! And make me like this always makes me feel as if I could drink like her and dry. Oh, you couldn't feel anywhere else at a time like this when the spirit of a man is pulsing to be out fighting oh. for the truth. With his feet trembling on the way maybe to the gallows and his ears tingling with a faint faraway sound of bursting oh. rifle shots that will maybe whip the last little shock of life out of him that's left lingering in his body. I felt a born and lump in me throat when I heard the band playing the soldier's song. Remembering last hearing it marching in military formation with the people staring on both sides at us, carrying with us the pride and resolution of Dublin to the grave of Wolf Town. Get the Dublin man going and they'll go on full force for anything that's trying to bear them away from what right. they're wanting. Where the slim thinking country boy would limp away from the first faintest touch of compromisation. Two more, Tom! <sighs> The memory of all the things that was done and all the things that was suffered by the people was booming in me brain. Every nerve in me body was quivering to do something desperate. Jammed as I was in the crowd, I listened to the speeches patterning on the people's head like rain falling on the corn. Every derogatory thought went out of me mind. And I said to myself, you can die now, Fluter. Oh, yeah. For you've seen the shadow dreams of the past leap into life in the bodies of living men, which prove if we were without a titter of courage for centuries, we're voice of air senil. Look at here. Oh. The blood was boiling in me veins. Oh, I, I was born into Tommy's sword. And wave and wave. Well, and... Yeah, stop your blathering for a minute, man, and let us hear what he's saying. We rejoice in this terrible war. The old heart of the earth needed to be warmed with the red wine of the battlefields. 
Such uh. august homage was never offered to God as this. Mm. The homage of millions of mm. lives given gladly for the love of country. Come on, man, this is still good to be missed. We must be ready to pour out the same <laughs> wine and the same glorious sacrifice. For without shedding of blood, there is no redemption. Sake. I stimulate myself from the shock of seeing the sight that's after going out. Another one for me, Tommy. The young gentleman's ordering it in the corner of his eye. Hey, hey. hell on there. Hell on there, Rosie. What are you holding on out here for? Didn't you hear the young gentleman say that he couldn't refuse anything to a nice little boy? What? Isn't that right, Jiggs? Didn't I know Tommy be all right? It takes Rosie to size a young man up. And tell the thoughts that are trembling in his mind. Isn't that right, Jakes? <laughs> Great meeting that's getting held outside. Well, it's up to us all, anyway, to fight for our freedom. Um, two more, please. Freedom. What's the use of freedom if it's not economic freedom? I used them very words just before you came in. <laughs> A lot of tricksters, says I. They wouldn't know what freedom was if they got it from their mother. <laughs> Didn't I, Tommy? I disremember. No, you don't disremember. Remember you said yourself, it was all only a flash of the pan? Well, flash of the pan or no flash of the pan, says I. They're not going to get Rosie Redmond, says I, to fight for freedom that wouldn't be worth winning in a raffle. <laughs> There's only one freedom for the worker man. Control of the means of production, rates of exchange, and the means of distribution. Look, here, comrade. I'll leave here tomorrow night for you. A copy of Janerski's thesis on the origin, development and consolidation of the evolutionary idea of the proletariat. Mm. If you ask Rosie, it's heartbreaking to see a young fella thinking of anything or admiring anything but silk transparent stockings showing off the shape of a little lassie's legs. <sighs> Out in the park in the shade of the warm summery evening with your little darling bridey to be. Kissing and cuddling. Kissing and cuddling, I... Hey, what are you doing? None of that now. None of that. <laughs> I've something else to be doing besides shenanigan after duties. Oh, little ducky. Oh, you shy little ducky. Never held a mat's hand and wouldn't know how to tiddle a little Judy. Tiddle him under the chin. Tiddle him under the chin. Hey, go on now. <laughs> I don't want to have any meddling with a lassie like you. Oh, Jesus! It's a monastery some of us ought to be. Spending our holidays kneeling in our doors, telling our beads and knocking hell out of our bosoms. It's terrible that that young Covey can't let me pass without prodding at me. Did you hear the murmur and cuckoo when we were passing? I wouldn't be everlasting cocking me ear to hear every little whisper that was floating around about me. <laughs> it's my rule never to lose me temper till it would be detrimental to keep it. There's nothing derogatory in the use of the word cuckoo, is there? It's not the word. It's the way he says it. He never says it straight out, but murmurs it with curious quivered and nipples like variations on a flute. Ah, uh, what odds if he gave it with variations on a trombone? What's yours going to be, Mum? Ah, uh, half a malt fluter. Three halves, Tommy. The Foresters is a gorgeous dress. I don't think I've seen nicer, mind you, in a pantomime. The loveliest part of the dress, I think, is the ostrich's plume. Mm -hmm. You are going along, and I see them waving and nodding and wagging. They seem to be looking at each as hanging at the end of a rope. Your eyes bulging and your legs twisting and jerking, gasping and gasping for breath while you are trying to die for Ireland. If any of them is hanging at the end of a rope, it won't be for Ireland. Are you going to start the young Kofi's game of prodding and thwarting a man? There's not many that's talking can say that for 25 years he'll never miss the pilgrimage to Bowdenstown. You're always blowing about going to Bowdenstown. Do you think no one but yourself ever went to Bowdenstown? I'm not blowing about it. But there's not a year that I go there but I pluck a leaf off Town's grave. And this very day, me prayer book is nearly full of them. Then Flota has a vice versa opinion of them that puts ivy leaves into their prayer books, scabbing it on the clergy, and trying to outdo the halos of the saints be making it look as if he was wearing around his head the glittered Narodi Body Alice. 
Sure, I don't care a damn if you slept in Bowdenstown. You can take your breakfast, dinner and tea on the grave in Bowdenstown if you like for fluter. Oh, don't start a fight, boys, for God's sake. I was only saying what a nice costume it is. Nicer than the kilts for... God forgive me, I always think the kilts is hardly decent. Ah, uh, sure, when you look at him, you'd wonder whether the man was making fun of the costume or the costume was making fun of the man. Now then, try to speak easy, will you? There he is now. I knew he wouldn't be long till he followed me in. I can't for the life of me understand how they can call themselves Catholics when they won't lift a finger to help poor little Catholic Belgium. What about poor little Catholic Ireland? Oh, you mind your own business, ma'am, and stupefy your foolishness be getting drunk. Take no notice of her, pay no attention to her. She's just tormenting herself towards having a row with somebody. There's a storm of anger tossing in me heart, thinking of all the poor Tommies, and with them me own son, drenched in water and soaked in blood, groping their way to a shattering death in a shower of shells. Young men with the sunny lust of life beaming in them, laying down their white bodies, shredded into torn and bloody pieces on the altar that God himself has built for the sacrifice of heroes. Isn't it a nice thing to have to be listening to a lassie and hanging our heads in a dead silence, knowing that some persons think more of a ball of malt than they do with the blessed saints? Wished. She's always dangerous and derogatory when she's well oiled. The safest way to hinder her from having any enjoyment out of her spite is to dip our thoughts into the fact of her being a female person that has moved out of the sight of ordinary sensible people. To look at some of the women that's knocking about now is a thing to make a body sigh. A woman on her own, drinking with a bevy of men, is hardly an example to her sex. A woman drinking with a woman is wanting. And a woman drinking with herself is still a woman. Flappers may be put in another category altogether. But a middle-aged married woman making herself the centre of a circle of men is as a woman that is loud and stubborn, whose feast abideth not in her own house. When I think of all the problems in front of the workers, it makes me sick to be looking at old codgers going about dressed up like... Green, accoutred figures gone astray out of a toy shop. Gracious God, give me patience to be listening to that blasted young Kofi prodding at me from the other end of the shop. Sissy Gogan's a woman living for nigh on 25 years in her own room. And beyond bidding the time of day to her neighbours, never yet as much as nodded her head in the direction of other people's business. While she knows some as are never content unless they're standing sentry over other people's doings. The last 16 months have been the most glorious in the history of Europe. Heroism has come back to the earth. War is a terrible thing, but war is not an evil thing. People in Ireland dread war because they do not know it. Ireland has not known the exhilaration of war for over a hundred years. When war comes to Ireland, she must welcome it as she would welcome the angel of God. No! Don't! No. No. There's only one war would happen. The war for the economic emancipation of the proletariat. They may throw away out of them, but it would be fitter for some of them to mend their ways and cease from having scouts out watching for the coming of the St. Vincent de Paul man for fear they'd be nailed lower than a pint of beer, mocking the man with an angel face, shining with the glamour of deceit and lies. And a certain lassie standing stiff behind her own door, with her ears cocked, listening to what's been said, stuffed till she's strained with the envy of a neighbour throwing a few little things that maybe got be hard striving to keep up to the letter of the law and the practices of the church. If I was you, Mrs. Gogan, I'd parry her jabbing remarks be a powerful silence that'll keep her tantalising words from penetrating into your feelings. It's always better to leave these people to the vengeance of God. Oh, but Bessie Borges doesn't put up to no much, never having a swagger in mind, thanks be to God, but going on packing up knowledge according to her conscience, precept upon precept, 
lion upon lion, here a little and there a little. But, thanks be to Christ, she knows when she was got, where she was got, and how she was got. While there's some she knows, decorating their finger with a well-polished wedding ring would be hard put to it if they were asked to show their wedding lion. You rip of a blasted liar! Me wedding ring's been well earned be twenty years be the side of me husband now taking his rest in heaven. Married to me be Father Dempsey in the chapel of St. Jude's in the Christmas week of 1895. And Danny Kid, living or dead, the Ginny Gogans had since was got between the borders of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and that's more than some of you can say that are kept from the dread of destruction by a few drowsy virtues. That the first whisper of temptation lulls into a sleep that'll know one sin from another only on the day of their last anointing. And that you use the innocent light of the shining stars to dip into the sins of a night's diversion. Liar to you too, ma'am. You old hardened trespasser on other people's good nature. Wizening up your soul in the arts and dodgeries till every drop of respectability in a female is dried up in her, looking at your ready made maneuvering with the mankind. Here, there, here, there, speak easy there. No, no round here, no Ginny, round Ginny, here now. It's a derogatory thing to be smashing a night like this with a row. It's romping with the feelings of hope we ought to be oh. instead of being vice versa. I'm terrible, Donnie, Mrs. Borges, and a fight leaves me weak for a long time afterwards. Please, Mrs. Borges, before there's damage done, try to have a little respect for yourself. Go away, you little sermonising, little yellow-faced, little consequential, little pudgy little bum, you! Luther, let go! I'm not going to be keeping an unresisting silence and her scattering her festering words in me face, stirring up every drop of decency in a respectable female with her restless rally of lies that will make a saint say his prayer backwards. Ah, everybody knows well that the best charity that can be shown to you is to hide the truth as much as our true worship of God Almighty will allow us. Here, hold the kid, one of you. Hold the kid for a minute. There's nothing for it but to show this lassie a lesson or two. Here. Hilda Kid Peter! Uh, 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 Come on now, me uh, loyal lassie! Dying with grief uh, for little Catholic Belgium! When Ginny Gogan's done with you, you'll have a little leisure lying down to think and pray for your king and country! Uh, uh, no, uh, since you can't have a friendly uh, little argument in quiet, you'll get out of this place in quick time. Go on, settle your differences somewhere else. I don't want to have another endorsement on my license. Uh, take, take your kid back out of this! How nicely I was picked now for her to be plumbed into my arms. She knew who she was giving it to, maybe. <laughs> now, I'm giving you fair warning, me young Covey, to quit firing your jibes and jeers at me, for one of these days I'll run out in front of God Almighty and take your sacred life. Uh, um, now, out you go. If you think me, lassie, that Busy Moore just has an untidy conscience, she'll soon show you to the dipper. Ah, he chases. Wait here till they give her back her youngster. Hey! There, hey! She's at the gauntlet out, our kid. What are we going to do with it now? <laughs> what are we going to do with it? Bring it outside and show everybody what you're after finding. <laughs> Pick it up, you flute, and run after her with it, will you? What do you take flute for? You must think flute is a right gum. You think flute is like yourself, destitute of a titter of understanding. Uh, take it up, man, and run out after her with it. Before she's gone too far, you're not going to leave the bloody thing here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, God Almighty, give me patience with all the scorners, tormentors, and thwarters that are always and ever trying to goad me into praying for their blinding and blasting and warning in the world to come. God, it's a relief to get rid of that crowd. Women is terrible when they start to fight. There's no holding them back. Are you going to have anything? Ah, we don't mind if we have another half. Two more, Tommy, me son. You know, there's no control in a woman when she loses her head. Devil use I having a trim little leg on a night like this. Things was never worse. Give us a half till tomorrow, Tom Ducky. No more tonight, Rosie. You owe me for three already. You'll be paid, won't you? I hope so. You hope so? Is that the way with you now? Give her one. 
it'll be all right. <sighs> all sport. Uh, the meeting should be soon over now. Sooner the better. It's all a lot of blasted nonsense, comrade. Oh, I wouldn't say it was all nonsense. After all, Flute, I can remember the time, and him only a dawny chiseler being taught at his mother's knee to be faithful to the Shan Van Vock. <sighs> That's all dope, comrade. Sort of thing that workers are fed on be the bourgeoisie. What's all dope? Though I'm saying it, that shouldn't... Uh, do, do you see that mark there under me eye? A sabre sliced from a dragoon in a Connell Street. Feel that dent in the middle of me nut. Oh my God, there's a holler. A scalp from a bobby's baton at a labour meeting in the Phoenix Park. Like he must have hit you a mistake. I don't know what you ever done for the labour movement. Do you not? Maybe then I've done as much and know as much about the labour movement as the chancers that are blown about it. Speak easy, Fluther. Mm. Try to speak mm. easy. No necessity to get excited about it, comrade. Excited? Who's getting excited? There's no one getting excited. It'll take more than a thing like you to flutter a feather of Fluther. Bladderton. And when all is said and done, you know as much as the rest in the wind-up. Yeah, well, let's put it to the test then. And see what you know about the labour movement. What's the mechanism of exchange? How the hell do I know what it is? There's nothing about that in the rules of my trades union. For God's sake, try to speak easy, Fluther. What does Karl Marx say about the relation of value to the cost of production? What the hell do I care what he says? I'm Irish man enough not to lose me head be folly and furtherness. Speak easy, Fluther. It's only a waste of time talking to you, comrade. Don't be comrading me, mate. I'd be on me last legs if I wanted you for a comrade. It seems a highly ridiculous thing to hear a thing that's only an inch or two away from a kid swinging heavy words about he doesn't know the meaning of and uppishly trying to down a man like Mr. Fluter here that's well flavoured in the knowledge of the world he's living in. No one's asking you to be buttoned in with your prate. I have you well taped, me lassie. Just you keep your opinions for your own place. It'll be a long time before the Covey takes any instructions or reprimanding from a prostitute. Oh, you louse! You louse, you! You're no man, you're no man! I'm a woman anyhow, and if I'm a prostitute myself, I have me feelings. Trying to put his arm around me a minute ago and give me the glad eye, the little ringed and lump of desolation turns on me now because he saw there was nothing doing. You louse you! If I was a man or you were a woman, I bait the puss off you. Hey, Rosie, hey, you'll have to shut your mouth altogether if you can't learn to speak easy. Hold on there, Rosie, hold on there. There's no necessity to flutter yourself when you're with Fluter. Any lady that's in the company of Fluter is going to get a fair hunt. This is outside your province. I'm not going to let you demean yourself be talking to a tethered and chancer. Leave this to Fluter. This is a man's job. Now... If you have anything to say, say it to Fluter. And let me tell you, you're not going to be past a remark about to any lady in my company. Sure, I don't care if you were running all night after your Mary of the Corn and Hair. But can you stay telling luscious lies about what you've done for the labour movement? It's nearly time to show you up. Is it you? Show Fluter up. Go away, man. I'd bait two years before me breakfast. Yeah, tell us where you bury your dead, will you? Sing a little less on the high nose, or when I'm done with you, you'll put a Christianable construction on things, I'm telling you. You're a big fella, you are. Eh? You know, you're tempting providence that... on your tempting Fluter. Easy with them hands, eh? Easy with them hands. You're starting to take a little risk when you commence to paw the coffee. Come on! Come on, you loser. Put your mitts up now. If there's a man's blood in you, be got in a few minutes, you'll see some snots flying around. I'm telling you, when you flew and Pluto's done with you, you'll have a voice of his opinion of him. Come on now. Come on. Here. Out you go, me little get off, baby. Get off. Because you've got a couple of hearts, you think you can as you like. Fluto's a friend of mine, and I'll not... Get go! Will you let go? A uh, fair hunt. Give him on a fair hunt. One minute with him is all I ask. One minute along with him while you're running for the priest and the doctor. Let him go, Tom. Let him go. Let him open the door to sudden death if he wants to. Come on. Why don't you go and do the bells? He's somewhere else. Thank God you put the fear of God in his heart that time. I thought you'd have to be dug out of him. The way you leapt out without any of your fancy sidestepping. And then like fluters, says I to myself. It's getting scarce nowadays. <laughs> I wasn't going to let myself be malignified if I'd be a chancer. He got a little bit too derogatory for Fluta. <laughs> Thank God to think of a cur like that coming to talk to a man like me. Did you ever? He's lucky he got off safe. 
I hit a man last week, Rosie, and he's fallen yet. So you'd have broken him in two if you hit him one clatter. Come on into the snug, me little darling. And we'll have a few drinks before I see you home. <laughs> huh? Oh, fluter. I'm afraid you're a terrible man for the women. <laughs> Three glasses of port. Oh. We won't have long to wait now. The time is rotten right for revolution. <laughs> you have a mother lying in Ireland is greater than a You have a wife, Clitheroe. Ireland is greater than a wife. <laughs> the time for <laughs> Ireland's battle is now. The place for Ireland's battle is here. Yes. But strong as they are, they cannot undo the miracles of God. Yes. Who ripens in the heart of young right. men the yeah. seeds sown by the young men of a former generation. They think they have pacified Ireland. <laughs> no, think they have seen everything. Think they have provided against everything. But the fools, the fools. The fools. Yes, they are. The fools. The fools. <laughs> they have left us our Fenian dead. And while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall no. never no. be peace. Imprisonment for the independence of Ireland. Wounds for the independence of Ireland. Death for the independence of Ireland. So, so help us, us God! God. Oh. Oh. Come on home out of that man. Are you afraid or what? Are you going to come home or you not? Of course I'm going home. Well, they tell me that I wouldn't go. Come on then, old sport. I once had a lover, a tailor, but he could do nothing for me. And then I fell in with a sailor As strong and as wild as the sea We cuddled and kissed with devotion Till the night from the morning had fled And there to our joy A bright bouncing boy Was dancing a jig in the bed <laughs> Dancing a jig in the bed And bawling for butter and bread and there to our joy, a bright bouncing boy was dancing a jig in the bed. <laughs> <laughs>